I think you, you may be surprised to learn this, but I think this was actually tongue in cheek. I know. No, you're joking. Yeah, no, this was not a <laughs> randomized controlled trial with uh, placebo. Oh, so, oh. welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by when Don and Chris are coming back to the podcast. Today. <laughs> the hey, answer is to that? We got the we got the original band back together. It's good to be here. Oh boy. I'm and so not glad. in the godly studio either. We are not in the godly studio. We are in fact still online. And as far as I can tell, we will be online for the for the rest of our lives from from what it's seeming like to me. It's but anyway, the ungodly studio. Exactly. So I'm Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. And I am here who, who with... needs no introduction? I am here with Chris Gill. Welcome, Chris. Hi. Good to be and back. And Don, Don Thea. Yeah, it's great to be back. Welcome back, What's guys. On? Both of them from the Department of Global Health. And let's get into it. So today in our first segment, which is our journal club, we're going to talk about a study that looked at the relationship between some vaccines and survival in Denmark. And then, Chris, you wanted to talk about this one because it has some implications for COVID. Am I right about that? That's right. Okay. Then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we'll talk about a paper on trials for COVID policy. And then in our amazing and amusing segment, we will get into some things that make us laugh out loud or just blew our minds. So let's go into segment one. So we're going to talk about an article that looked at the impact of smallpox and tuberculosis vaccination and survival in Denmark. This is published in the International Journal of Epidemiology. I think this may be the first ever paper we've done from the International Journal of Epidemiology. And interestingly enough, it was chosen by Chris, not by me. I'm no, usually no, it was the... chosen by me. Oh, sorry. Not Chris. Sorry, Don. It was by Don, not I was, Chris. I just seconded the, point... the nomination. The point is, I am usually the International Journal of Epi guy. Uh, So the study was entitled, Vaccinations Against Smallpox and Tuberculosis Are Associated with Better Long-Term Survival, a Danish case cohort study, 1971 to 2010, by first author Andreas Reichmann of the Research Center for Vitamins and Vaccines, which I thought was an interesting combination, uh, and that is in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's interesting to me, the title of this one in that it it gives the result in the headline, which is, you know, one of those sort of things that is interesting about how you set up uh, the title. But this one seems to give the headline. Now, I only found one news headline about this particular article was from the Scientist magazine, which says an old TB vaccine finds a new life in coronavirus trials, which clearly obviously doesn't specifically relate to this (laughs) study, even though it referenced this study because. No, but I am going to I am going to tie them together. Yep. No, and I think you are. But I just thought it was an interesting headline since it actually was not directly about coronavirus in any way. But we'll come back to Don explaining this. But Don, can you first tell us what this study was about and what they did? Well, let me let me let me give a little bit of a lead up to this, because I think it would be it would be helpful for people to understand why I chose this. And Chris seconded it. Chris and I had been talking about uh, this observation that uh, a study that was done where the, the observation was made that countries that have BCG vaccinations seem to have less coronavirus infections. BCG is SARS. the vaccination for tuberculosis. Right, right. So it's a live bacterial vaccination that is given um, in developing countries to minimize the possibility that children will get TB meningitis or miliary, which is sort of tuberculosis that's distributed all over the body. And as, when Chris mentioned this, I said, nah, nah, I don't believe it. That that just makes no sense at all. And then I started to do some reading, and it turns out that there actually is a fair amount of evidence to suggest that vaccination with a live vaccine, whether it's BCG, which is a bacterial vaccine, or the smallpox, vaccinia vaccine, or even measles or polio vaccine, does something to the immune system in a non-specific way that kind of juices it up and makes people or individuals less susceptible to subsequent infections. And the idea is that if populations of people could be pre-vaccinated with oral polio vaccine or BCG, it may jazz their immune system to, to such an extent in a similar sort of a way that they could have either a prevention from getting infected or less serious disease. And some of the prior evidence to suggest this 
is that in, for instance, in 1959, there was an, um, an oral polio outbreak in Singapore, and it was an outbreak with one strain of, of polio virus, and they used a different strain of the vaccine, and it seemed to work, which it shouldn't have worked because mm-hmm. it was directed against um, a different strain. And there were a bunch of studies in the 1970s which showed that people who had gotten oral polio vaccine had a three to four fold reduction in subsequent influenza infection. There was a study in, in Guinea-Bissau and Africa, which seemed to indicate that people, children who got OPV at birth had a 32% decrease in infant mortality. And then there's some really interesting um, stuff that's come out recently in terms of something called immunologic memory. So that when a child gets measles, what happens is the measles virus induces this kind of knockoff of the memory cells that it has developed, having been exposed to all these infections. So when it gets measles, those memory cells are, are, are lost. And therefore, in the aftermath of measles, these children are more susceptible to other viral infections. And conversely, there's kind of this unexplained observation that in the aftermath of a live measles vaccine, the infant mortality goes down by a considerable amount. So there's all this evidence to suggest that in fact, there might be something going on here. So that kind of brings us to this paper, which I thought was was interesting because it was a paper that was done in Copenhagen and it was a retrospective analysis looking at mortality among a cohort of children who had sort of been at the vaccination age that they would typically get either vaccinia or BCG, and they observed different cohorts of children over a period of time when those two vaccinations were removed. And they then retrospectively looked at all of these kids, and they matched a bunch of data sets in terms of the vaccinations that they got and then the death outcomes. And they were able to amass a huge cohort of 47,000 school children who were born in 1965 to 1967. um, And they had a whole bunch of deaths. And they looked at those deaths and categorized them into whether they were natural deaths or accidental deaths or suicide. And they followed them for, what was it, 30 years? Mm -hmm. Yep. And they essentially found that In the cohorts who were five years old, between 65 and 68, who had gotten BCG or Vaccinia, they had, what was it? I think it was a- It's almost a half, half, right? Yeah, 42% reduction. Almost 50% reduction in death in comparison to the cohorts that either had neither BCG or Vaccinia or Vaccinia only, I believe. So, you know, I thought it was was really a, a pretty remarkable observation that they were able to show that there were these 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 decreases in all in natural cause of death in in these populations over um, a relatively short period of time, but that that effect also persisted. I think in in one instance when they got both vaccinations for children who live for thirty years, so that that same protective effect seemed to persist for thirty years. Yeah, so it's an interesting study design. So they use this, uh, something different than we've ever talked about before, which is this case cohort design, which is really just a way of thinking about a, a case control study, but in which you you set up a cohort of, of, in this case, kids. You're following them forward in time, but you at the beginning, you select a sub-cohort, just sort of a randomly selected group of kids that are essentially the control group. You follow them forward. You collect all of the all of the outcomes. Those are your cases, and then you compare the cases to the that sub cohort. And the the advantage there is that if you have the sub cohort, you could then you know you could do lots of different things with it. You could use compare use it as a comparison group for different outcomes. You could if you had banked samples, let's say you could have a full cohort of kids that you're following, but in just sample the the sub cohort for the you know the really expensive biomarkers that you want to calculate so there's a lot of advantages to this particular design but really it's a it's a essentially a case control study and it, it as you say i mean they found roughly a, a 50% reduction in in mortality over roughly a 30 year period for kids who had received one or or both of these vaccinations which is as you say it's it's remarkable if it is in fact true chris 
What's your what's your assessment of the of the quality of the study? Did you did you like it? Yeah, I really did. I thought it was it was very interesting. I mean, it's not it's you know it's not a randomized controlled trial, so we have to always bear that in mind that there could be some sort of hidden hidden confounding here that they haven't adjusted for. But there were a, a number of strengths to the analysis that that I thought were somewhat persuasive. One was just the sort of the rigor of the design itself and the extent of the follow up. You know, the situation in Denmark is is, is sort of better designed for this because everybody's assigned a national ID number, which links to all sorts of registries. And so they had a very good way of of creating their data set for this analysis. And so there didn't seem like there was there was a lot of hidden loss to follow up, for example, which was which was very reassuring. I think also one of the sub analyses they did was was rather thoughtful, which was to look at whether there was a, a change in cancer mortality as a function of BCG or the vaccine of vaccine. And there was not. And you you wouldn't think there was because cancers are, you know, in, in, in all cases, nearly all cases at least, are, are genetic diseases, not inflammatory diseases. So, so if, you're, if you're thinking that, you know, the, the, the effect of BCG is to somehow tweak the immune system in some nonspecific way that might offer all sorts of advantages against all sorts of inflammatory conditions, you would not think that that would necessarily have much of an impact on most cancers. And indeed, it did not. And so I thought that was was an important internal control if we're thinking that this is all about sort of hidden socio-demographic biases. Because again, the cancer should also go down because of the same sort of risk factors that often, you know, associate with particularly like lung cancers or bladder cancers or colon cancers, which are, are lifestyle dependent cancers. And so so I thought that was that was very interesting. And then there's the whole sort of biological plausibility, which gets to this really intriguing hypothesis about about these nonspecific vaccine effects do, I think, in particular to live attenuated vaccines as opposed to inactivated subunit vaccines. And so I, th- I think this is this is kind of where Don and, and I were hoping to go, because one of the interesting things that's been sort of bandied about, and I will also confess that I was very skeptical of, was you whether were. whether BCG might have a an impact on COVID nineteen mortality rates. So as sort of like a side story to this, Don and I are currently doing a, a study in Lusaka where we're looking at the impact of COVID nineteen in Zambia on mortality. And we had heard anecdotally from our colleagues in Zambia that there were very few COVID-19 deaths. And I think we, we were and still are somewhat skeptical and we're still puzzled as to why that would be because it seems to be exploding practically everywhere else that we look. And we've now been following this group for, for a couple of weeks now. So it's early on and we will see, obviously. But we still have not had a single individual identified who died of COVID-19 coming through the largest teaching hospital in Lusaka. And so I'm, 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 you know, starting to scratch my head a little bit and wonder, like, is there something in fact that's different about the biology of sub-Saharan African individuals that may be protecting them? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go too down, too far down yeah, this, no, we're, this pathway. Not the same. We're not seeing the same thing in South Africa. I mean, that's that's clearly different. That's right. I mean, there, there's so many but, but, things that can be going on here, but it is but intriguing. Wanna, go ahead, go ahead, Don. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to make one point in in terms of what you mentioned about cancer, and it's really curious because one of the mainstays of bladder cancer is instilling BCG into the Good into the bladder, point. and it has a very pronounced effect in terms of of being lytic on the on the bladder cancer cells. Hold on, um, hold on. You're going to have to back up there cuz I didn't follow that. What do, what do you mean BCG? So, so, so bladder cancer is characterized by cancer of the epithelium lining the inside of the bladder. And so people get chemotherapy for that. But one of the sort of tried and true other methods of controlling the 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 cancer cells in the bladder is to is to infuse into the interior of the bladder, BCG, live BCG vaccine. And essentially- TB. It, Live TB vaccine. You got no, it. BCG, BCG vaccine. So, so the same thing that we're talking strain. about here. It's an attenuated strain of, right, of TB. And, yeah, yeah. and it's, but it's alive and then it, multipl- it multiplies and it, it produces bladder inf- inflammation in a very nonspecific way. But that also re- results in a decrease in the bladder cancer cells. Hmm. So- in fact, there is a whole arm of oncology that is looking at the properties of these live vaccines to actually have these nonspecific cancer-killing effects on other kinds of cancers. So even though they didn't see that in this cohort, it is something that is an active field of study. Okay, so that's really interesting. I had no idea about that. And and we 
Am I wrong? I, I totally remember us doing a previous episode in which we talked about BCG, BCG in and, relation and to diabetes, diabetes, wasn't it? Type, right? Type yeah. one diabetes, I think it was. I can't. I can't. It's amazing to me that I can't remember. But I'm sure we had an episode. We did. I'm sure Nick could could pull it out of the archives. But so there, there, there does appear like you know it's plausible that there is something going on. I have to admit I don't totally understand it, but I'm, I'm not necessarily trained to be able to understand it. But I am. I so what I look at though is, is this a is the effect size that we're observing plausible? I mean, a a 50% reduction in mortality over a 30-year period. Now, so one of the things that's worth pointing out here is this is, you know, you, you remarked at the the long follow-up and the large sample size. Well, these are, of course, these are Danish record-based studies, so they don't actually have to literally follow everyone. That's why they can do these amazing studies. And the reason they followed people for 32 years only is because this was a cohort of patients born in you know the 60s and, and early 70s. So that's kind of the maximum, you're getting close to the maximum follow-up that you could do on these people. But, you know, so so these are people who are fairly young, you know, they, they, they're probably in their mid to late 40s on average, early 50s, maybe. Is a 50% reduction in mortality, or in this case, a 50% increase associated with not getting the BCG or or smallpox vaccine really plausible? See, Matt, this is the same reaction that I had when Chris first first proposed this to me. I said, this makes no sense at all. Absolutely no sense at all. But then when I started doing the reading and I started to see all of these other kind of similar scenarios with similar effects, it began to make me really wonder whether there's something going on here that these live vaccines are able to induce an enhanced innate immunity. In fact, they call it trained innate immunity. So if this was the only study that I saw, I would have, I would have been very, very skeptical. But you know, the whole body of, of, of uh, research that, that seems to suggest that this is a real phenomenon gives me a little bit more you know, optimism about this being a, a real finding. Yeah. And wouldn't you also expect, though, then, I mean, we in the United States don't use BCG. It might, might be worth saying why we don't use BCG vaccination in the U.S. Because there's almost no tuberculosis in the U.S. And BCG has a certain amount of, of risk because I think, what is it, Chris, about 1 percent of people who get a BCG vaccine since it's a live vaccine can have a have a bad reaction. I don't. I don't recall what the safety risks are. Uh, I don't know what the rates of of serious adverse events are with BCG. But one one of the other issues too is that BCG will give you a false positive on your skin test, and since That's the true. U.S. relies so heavily on skin tests for TB surveillance, yeah, TB tests. Uh, so yes, uh, it would be very difficult for. It, it sort of con- confounds the efforts of public disease control people to and have. So if so, if we're not using it, and uh, has it used much in Europe? Uh, oh. it, it, it is not used in most of Europe, but it is the most widely used vaccine in the world still, I believe. And so yeah. if there's a if there's really a 50 percent reduction in mortality associated with a, a vaccine like this, wouldn't we expect that in countries using BCG, that would be like substantially better life expectancy, at least up until the age of, of 50 for people in countries using this, I, I mean, which we don't see, right? Yeah. I mean, it. Well, you know, have we really made those comparisons? You know, I mean, there are so many risks to health in a lot of the, a lot of these developing countries that you, I think you, you need to have a very large kind of randomized controlled trial to, to, to look at it with, with populations that comprise the same sort of sort of a risk in terms of all of the all of the diseases that are you know, indigenous to these countries, whether it's, you know, malaria or leishmaniasis or, you know, all right, of those. Right, other things. right, right. And I and I and I agree with all that. I guess my, my my point here is not that I don't I don't buy it. I'm I have to admit I'm more skeptical than you both are. But I think that's because again I don't have the the training to truly be able to understand why this oh, would. I'm, I'm I'm still plenty of skeptical, Matt. Please don't get oh, okay. me wrong. But, but, I, I'm, but I'm more I'm, I'm more skeptical about the size of the effect than anything. Chris, go ahead. What are your what are your what's your your skepticism? No, I mean it, uh, my my skepticism is is along the. Along your lines, it's an extraordinarily high effect size, large effect size, and it, it it does kind of, you know, it seems almost too good to be true. So I'd like to see this, you know, in an experimental design rather than in a epidemiologic design. I, you know, I think that the the hypothesis is is plausible. 
I think the effect size is is large, and you know we've been you know we've seen this sort of historically that 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 the larger the effect size in some ways the, the you know the more skeptical you you need to be. So I don't know. I I, I think it's it's worth taking a deeper dive on this. Mm-hmm. And I was just actually trying to go on to clinicaltrials.gov to see if anyone was actually planning to do a BCG. There are two, Chris. There's two that, have been, that are uh, currently underway. I think there are, they are RCTs. Trials uh, BCG. for BCG for, against looking COVID? At BCG against COVID, right. You know, one of the other things that I thought was, was I'm, I'm also skeptical. I'm, I'm not nearly as enthusiastic about okay. this as All I right. sound. Good, good, good. But I think the other thing about this study that was um, helpful for me to sort of believe it a little bit more is that they had a very, very low non-matching rate, something like 0.2%. That they were not able, meaning. Mean, meaning that they that they were able to identify them as cohort members and and were able to follow them all the way through and match them up with whatever health records they had available yep. to them, and they also did not see the same phenomenon among people who had accidental deaths or who had suicide. So this effect was pronounced only in those who died of natural causes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they, they they had a nice negative control, which we talked about a number of times before. That is a nice way to sort of try to see whether confounding explains the results. So they looked at whether or not BCG and smallpox vaccination were associated with death from murder. What were the other ones? Suicide, uh, suicide and, and accidents. And accidents. And they didn't observe any effect. And so that is some suggestion that, that maybe this isn't explained away by just some confounding. Although I will say, and I agree, and, and to me that, that makes sense, but it, it was a little surprising to me that there was roughly a, a twofold or a 50% reduction for cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, and I can't remember what else. And just the fact that they were all the same, also, again, you know, one of those things when things kind of line up perfectly does make me wonder about confounding as one confounding effect could explain why you observe the same effect for you know several different things. But, you know, I, it does also seem to me like there's something going on. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, when you dig into the tables too, it looked like most of the effect was associated with the BCG vaccination and not necessarily the vaccinia. Mm -hmm. for the smallpox vaccination. So it may be that there's something very specific to BCG itself. Sure. One other question for you guys. So one of the, they they didn't have a a ton of variables that they were controlling for, but one of the things that they controlled for was eczema. Yeah. I was confused by that. I mean, obviously I know that (laughs) eczema is a, uh, it's counterindicated to getting smallpox vaccination. Right. Is that right? I think that's why they were looking at that. Is, but, is the smallpox vaccine interaction? And, but for in order for it to be an actual confounder, it would also have to have an effect on on these natural deaths. And presumably, there's no reason to think that having eczema increases your risk for death by age forty or fifty. Does it? Uh, I can't think of a reason why it would. I mean, eczema is pretty benign anyway. Yeah. Yeah, good point. I, I, I guess they were just less interested in this group because they yeah. would systematically be excluded from getting uh, vaccinia. But you're right that it has to have that second link, doesn't it? Well, I think there's, this is one of those uh, age-old confusions I think that people have about case control type studies, whereas it, we're in a cohort study, you exclude people who are not at risk for the outcome. And so a lot of people originally thought that therefore in a case control study, you should exclude people who are not at risk for the exposure. But in fact, it makes no difference whether or not you're at risk for the exposure. All that matters is you are or are not exposed. Mm-hmm. Before we move on, I do want to just a couple of last things. One, um, one thing that it occurred to me that there is certainly the potential for some exposure misclassification as to whether or not people got the vaccinations. I, d- I don't see any reason why that would contribute to any kind of, of large bias. Other than that, I couldn't really come up with, with any other major sources of error other than the ones we've talked about that I, I, I still have some skepticism around the, the potential for confounding to explain some of this result. But I do think that the negative control use was, was good. Anyone, anyone have any last thoughts? I think um, at the time that the vaccinations were compulsory and if people didn't comply, they'd be fine. So I think the, the level of participation was really pretty high in Copenhagen. Participation would be high. I just question whether or not it was correctly recorded. But I, yeah. yeah, I would, I would certainly agree with you. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to our second segment, in which we are going to talk about an article that was published in the New York Times, but sort of refers to a larger body of evidence, or, or I guess I should say a, a bigger debate, really, but some other reports that have come out on this. And the article was 
by Denise Grady, and it was entitled Researchers Debate Infecting People on Purpose to Test Coronavirus Vaccines. And so this is the idea of whether or not we put people into trials of coronavirus vaccination and we then you know, let them go out into the world and see whether or not they get exposed and whether or not they actually get coronavirus or COVID-19, or do we actually directly infect people, expose people to both the vaccine and then also the virus itself. The reason that you would want to do the second is that if you do the first, where you just give people the vaccine or the placebo, and then you send them out into the world, if people aren't being exposed to it very much, or there are just differences in the areas where the virus is is circulating, you could end up with either a low level of people becoming exposed and therefore any benefit might not be as great as it could have otherwise be observed to be, and you can get some confusing results. Or you do actually have the potential for confounding by exposure to the coronavirus just you know by chance, and that of course could cloud the results. So the solution to that would be to simply give people either the coronavirus a vaccine or the placebo, and then also expose them directly in the lab to the to the coronavirus itself. But of course, there are ethical issues that that come along with that. This is something that has been done before. So these are referred to as challenge trials. The article points out that these have been used for typhoid, cholera, malaria, and other diseases. So for malaria, volunteers stuck their arms into chambers full of mosquitoes to be bitten and infected. But in those cases, as they point out, there were also rescue medications for those who actually did get sick, whereas there's no cure for COVID. So the question is, there is some benefit in terms of doing these challenge trials. And another benefit I probably also didn't list was time, that it, you can you can do these studies faster if you expose people directly to the coronavirus because your, your number of events will go up and therefore you need a, a smaller sample size and you know they're exposed, so you don't need to follow them for probably as long. But of course, there's, this is ethically questionable. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the question really is, should we be doing this? Is this defensible, given that we are in a global pandemic where the ethical dilemma is different than what it would be if we were not in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. So, Chris, let me start with you. What are your what are your what's your reaction to this? OK, so I'm going to put the, the the ethical issues aside just for a moment and, okay. and, and focus more on on what are what are some of the advantages of, of doing this. And so you mentioned speed and efficiency, and, and, and that is certainly true. So right now, the NIH, uh, in partnership with Moderna, uh, are launching into a phase three clinical trial, randomized control trial of the Moderna vaccine. It's going to have 30,000 subjects in it. So it's a, it's a monster of a trial. It's going to be multi-site and uh, probably costs, you know, I would guess $100 million, I would guess. So with a trial of that scale, it is very difficult to, to really understand the immunology of the disease that you're studying. What you can do efficiently is show whether your vaccine prevents clinical disease, meaning mm -hmm. that you get the vaccine and then, you know, a month later you know, or you don't get the vaccine and then a month later you start feeling pokey. So you go in and voila, you've got COVID-19. And so you look at the rates in the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, and you can, you know, infer the vaccine efficacy. But what you can't really do is understand the immunology of this because you would, it would require that you have done baseline uh, immunologic tests on all 30,000 subjects, or at least harvested some blood that could be analyzed later. And even that is logistically really, really, really challenging and expensive. Mm -hmm. And to do T cell experiments, looking at T lymphocytes, it's even more difficult, as Don knows, because the T cells don't don't live long, and so you kind of need fresh T cells. So it's very very difficult to sort of understand the T the T cell mediated immunology. Now with COVID nineteen, we don't understand the immunology of this of the disease. As you, as you know, there's constant debates about you know can people be reinfected? Is it an antibody mediated defense? Is it a T cell mediated defense? Is it both? You know, we don't know. We're throwing our hands up now. In a challenge study, you could you could really study this with a fine tooth comb because you only need maybe two dozen volunteers to do this kind of work, even less perhaps. And you can get all of the bloods and the tests done as you need on a daily basis. You could really study the heck out of this thing. And, you know, that is a direct pathway to understanding what are the immunological correlates? What are the things that a vaccine would need to be able to do in order to, to lead to immunity? And so you can show in a 30,000 vaccine, you know, subject vaccine trial that your vaccine works. What you can 
can't tell is how it worked. And that mm -hmm. means that you can't then use that information to bridge to a, another vaccine that might also be trying to achieve licensure, you know, perhaps uh, sometime down the road when the COVID-19 numbers have fallen. And so it's no longer possible to do a randomized controlled trial because there isn't enough disease, you see. So this, this approach really allows you to, to study the, the question in a different way than you could possibly do in a classical randomized controlled trial. So that, that is one enormous advantage. A second thing is that, you know, there's a lot of sort of basic questions about COVID-19 infection that we don't know, such as how much does the dose matter? Like if I spray, you know, a thousand infectious units up your nose in saline versus 10,000 versus 100,000, what is the threshold above which people start to become more likely to be infected, which tells you a lot about the epidemiology of the disease in terms of what is the intensity of the exposure that really starts to matter. You can't do that in a classic randomized controlled trial because you never, you never observe the actual moment of infection. You don't know how it happened. Mm -hmm. The third thing you could do is you could look to see does the route of administration of, of, or the, the route of contact matter? That is to say, if you inhale the virus through aerosols, is that equivalent to getting it up your nose, like, like the common cold would be? Or is that equivalent to um, having it get into your eye? Like, it, do we really believe that, that getting coronavirus in your eye necessarily leads to coronavirus pneumonia? Actually, we haven't the foggiest idea whether that's true. It might just lead to conjunctivitis, and it might even lead to immunity. We have no idea, right? And so all of these questions could be addressed in this way, looking at the incremental dose infection response, which would be another way of kind of understanding, like, why is it that children don't seem to get the disease versus older people do get the disease, right? Because probably some of that is that there's a dose response effect and above a certain dose, it's getting, it's, you know, it, it, it more easily gets into the immune, past the immune system, the innate immune system of an older person than a younger person. But that's a theory. We could actually test that theory. So you could even test to see whether scratching it into your skin, like we do with vaccinia, would, would lead to a, a totally different immune response. All of that could be explored. And of course, you could, you could do the same thing pre and post of like a vaccine study to look at how the vaccine, you know, um, changes the immune response. And there's one more okay. thing before I, I stop talking, which is, which is one of the, one of the, the, the other interesting things is, would be to bring these subjects back who had been experimentally exposed with coronavirus and re-expose them to see, to test this question, can you get coronavirus twice, which you basically can't do in a classical vaccine trial. So there's, like, there's so many upsides to this, but the downside is that you might kill someone. By doing and this. And that's a kind that's of a, a big, big downside. downside. That's a big downside. But, you know, they, they are talking about only recruiting people for this who are between the ages of 18 and 25. So very low risk to them, but not zero risk. Therein yeah, lies but, the rub. Well, but the, I mean, so therein lies the rub, but also, you know, that negates some of the questions that you were just saying this would be beneficial for if you limit it to those who are already at lower risk for severe consequences. You know, it. It, it seems to me that there are some some benefits, but there are also some challenges. And then there is the ethics, and and those benefits are only viable if the if the ethics are such that we really can justify this. Don, what's what's your take on it? Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting dilemma. I, you know, to a certain extent, I, I I absolutely agree with Chris, and I think on top of that, we're going to have a a very rough road ahead of us in terms of establishing vaccine efficacy. There's a, there's a, over 125 vaccine candidates out there. And the 30,000 enrollments into a vaccine trial that Chris was alluding to is, is really only the beginning. Because if, in fact, you enroll 30,000 people, you've got to have a certain amount of events in the placebo arm in order for you to have a sufficient number of outcomes and events to be able to have the power to be able to make those comparisons. And if you enroll a population of people you can't tell them to purposefully expose themselves. You have to, you know, ethically, you have to say, you got to wear a mask, you got to socially distance, you got to do all this other stuff. And if you don't, after 30,000 enrollments, get the number of events, then you've got to go up to 40,000 and 50,000 and 60,000. And this is what happened with the RSV vaccine. And that means that a, that a, a, a trial that, that is intended to last six months has to now last nine months or 12 months or even longer. Can I can I push back on that just a little bit though? And I, I sure. agree with I agree with most of what you just said there, but it's it's hard for me to understand 
why you would necessarily need 30,000 people, given how much coronavirus is circulating. But I could be totally wrong about that. And that's, that's, you know, obviously, something that I'm sure they take into account. So I don't, I'm not concerned about that. But I was surprised by that number. But, but I'm a little surprised here, you say that it would be you ethically, you would have to tell people to, to do all these things. And yet, the solution to that is we're just going to infect you with coronavirus, or we're going to expose you to the coronavirus directly. I mean, that seems, you know, the the ethical, that seems to be not telling people slipper, to- Yeah, an ethical slippery slope. Yeah. It seems like the middle ground would be to to put people in a, a traditional randomized trial, but just not tell them to to go out and, and you know, change their behavior. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same thing that we had with, you know, with HIV vaccines. You know, you, you, you can't enroll somebody into an HIV vaccine and not give them, you know, proper- proper education about how to avoid getting getting infected. You no, know, no, I, got- I, that all makes sense to me. But I'm saying, so why would the solution to that, though, then be that we are actually going to infect people with this disease? How is that ethically justified, whereas it's not ethically justifiable to to give people a placebo or or a, a well that that's that they're in lies for us that's, I mean, that's, that's why this issue. Is, that's why this is is this is controversial but you, yeah. know, you know there there's a there's a there's a movement to do this there's a there's actually a uh, um a we- a website that is named one day sooner where you can yep. go and volunteer and I, yep. i'm looking at it right now currently there are 31254 people across 140 countries who have volunteered to be in a challenge study which is, so, I find so interesting because, of course, there are also surveys that say, you know, 30% of the United States won't take a vaccine if, if right. one becomes available. So you've got right. these sort of opposing sides of, of I don't know if it's that, vac- that that website is just for the U.S., but, but you have these opposing sides of some people who are very willing to put themselves at risk for the purposes of science and other people who are not. And, you know, to me, that obviously is an indication that there are people who are very willing to, you'd really, really, really have to do that right, of course, to make sure mm-hmm. that people understood what they were getting themselves into. But if if people really, truly know the risks and they make that decision anyway, obviously that is well, their wait decision. A I, I think, I think it, it would be really, really difficult at, at this point in this pandemic for us to be able to actually inform them what all the risks are, because we don't know what the risks are. Mm-hmm. Every week we're coming up with new risks. And there's this uh, report that came out of Germany where there are all these central nervous system effects that, that occur later on, like weeks or months after you've resolved your primary symptoms. You get you know hallucinations and dementia and all these potentially yep. really horrible things. So yep. I, I think informing them of what the risks are is, is, mm-hmm. is not something we can completely do at this point. However, there is... There is precedent sure. for altruistic acts of this nature. And I, and, and I think the most obvious one is service in the uh, military. You know, it's, it's, a, it's volunteer. You are going into harm's way deliberately. There are risks that are known and there are risks that are unknown. One of the things we do know is that the mortality in the U.S. Army in the last decade or so has been about 40 per 100,000, okay, which is a lot higher than the estimated mortality risk in an 18 to 25 year old, same age range as most people who serve from COVID-19. It's much higher. And so I I think the idea that it is inherently wrong to allow people to make a sacrificial altruistic gesture to absorb some risk for the common good, I don't think that that's unprecedented in the least. And so I, I, I feel like we, you know, there is room here to consider that if people are fully informed, just as they are when they volunteer to join the U.S. Army or the Marine Corps, even higher risk, uh, they, they know on some level that they are absorbing a certain degree of known and, a, and some degree of unknown risk uh, by doing yeah, so. Yeah, no, I mean, of course, you, you're, you're getting into the exact same – it's the same types of risk – if you are in the the trial that doesn't directly expose you to COVID, it's just that we know the the probability of your exposure to COVID is 100. percent That's that is the main difference. So I, I hear you. I have not thought of, I have never heard or thought of that military analogy before, and it's an interesting one. I I don't know what the what the sort of other side of that would be, but I I find that really interesting. So where in the end do you guys come down on this? I I think that there is. <laughs> There is so much value to this, and I and I appreciate that that you know a challenge study of this nature is not going to be able to answer all questions. And, and Don made the point earlier, right on, that you know we can't study this in vulnerable patients because the risk of dying is not trivial; it's it's super high. 
And of course, they're the ones who suffer the most from COVID-19. But to my mind, there is less to be learned by studying immunological failures, which is why most of the elderly die, than there is in learning about immunological successes, which is what we're hoping to learn from in the youth. If we can mm -hmm. understand why it is that people fight off coronavirus infection, that is tremendously valuable to know in terms of vaccine design. And, and, and you know, if we think again about this 30,000 subject trial, which probably comes with a price tag of $100 million, you know, the resources to run trials of, of that kind are completely inadequate if we have 150 st candidates out there. We're not going to be able to do those trials for 150 candidates. You know, obviously, we wouldn't, we wouldn't imagine that it would come to that. But this is a much more efficient way of screening candidates than it is of running $100 million trials one after another. So what was you the know, answer to the question? Where do you so come I, down on I, this? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's ethically justified. I think the informed consent would have to be meticulous and voluminous. Um, and patients would really need to be counseled uh, in all sorts of ways and screened. And it still yeah. wouldn't tell you everything, but no, no scientific experiment does. Don, what about you? I would ask George Annis. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Who, who, you got to tell people who George Annis is. <laughs> right. so, so, so George Annis is, is a faculty member at uh, BU School of Public Health who is an eminent ethicist on yep. medical ethics. And so he, he, I'm sure, will have a very well thought out, very learned. And but has never well served in Iraq, as far as I know opinion you know the other thing i was thinking about is that would be that would be on the um, positive side of the ledger is that as chris was saying we could study the hell out of this and we could learn a lot about the immune the immune response because the immune response seems to be becoming a really critical part of this disease it's 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 potentially much more important than the actual virus replication mm -hmm. in cells. It's the immune response and the damage that the immune response is doing throughout the yeah. body, whether it's in the central nervous system or in the blood vessels. And to be able to get a handle on what that's all about, I think would be incredibly valuable. I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm going to punt on this one. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to punt as well because I find this one, it's really a quandary for me. So I guess we are, Chris is, Chris is in favor and Don and I are a little bit on the on the fence. All right. Well, let's move on to our last segment, our, our always favorite segment, our amazing and amusing, where we get into some of the things that make us laugh out loud or that just amaze us. Don, you want to you wanna go first? Oh, boy, there's so much to choose. <laughs> All right. So here is a study that appeared in Nature Scientific Reports in July of 2017. And the title is In Vivo Biomagnetic Characterization of the American Cockroach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By Ling Jong Kong, Thomas Pasterek, et al. I had no idea that there are members of the insect as well as the animal kingdom that apparently can find their way by uh, sensing changes in magnetic structure or magnetic forces. And mm -hmm. I think that, okay. you know, we kind of knew that about sharks and stuff, but apparently this is an innate characteristic of the American cockroach. Hmm. And it turns out that they have actual very small magnetized nanoparticles in their, in, their, in their bodies. And so what these guys did was to take an extremely strong magnet and look <laughs> oh, at and put, and, and, and put a group <laughs> of live cockroaches and a group of dead cockroaches what? into this really strong magnet. see who magnet. would run the maze faster? Who thinks well, of these <laughs> things? I know, I know. Okay, this okay, okay. Let's take some cockroaches. Right, and right, we'll put right. them in a box with a giant right. magnet. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And so, and so, what they what they looked at was they looked at the migration of these inherent magnetic particles within the cockroaches based on ha on a, a super strong <laughs> magnet. And it turns out that these magnetic particles migrated within the cockroach to a much less extent if the cockroach was dead than if the cockroach was alive. So there is something about being alive that magnetizes <laughs> right, right. a cockroach. So, so apparently they attribute this to the fact that when a cockroach dies, the endolymph, sort of the juice that runs throughout the inside <laughs> of the cockroach. I did not want to think about it that way. Go far ahead. more viscous. And because it's far more viscous, <laughs> these little magnetized particles 
have a hard time like moving around within the cockroach. So, okay, so <laughs> is the is the message here? Dead cockroaches are not as good at getting through mazes as live cockroaches. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so if you're lost in sea and you, your compass has failed, you should have a live cockroach. Live cockroach, just in case. Uh, I guess. Wow. I guess. So they run okay. to magnetic north. Can you use it? Can you stick them on a little spike and see if they spin? I'm sure you can. I, I guess maybe the thing to do is if you live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, just get a big magnet, and you won't have a cockroach problem. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. These things are important to know. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Chris, what about you? What do you got? Well, I've got a, a two-part presentation, but the second part is going to be in the next episode. So, okay. So it's like a part. Two weeks from now? So it's like next summer. Yeah, two weeks from now. Yep. Uh, they'll get the other the first part. But the, the, the it, this is a pair of papers that I mentioned to Don before about the uh, transmission of, of respiratory viruses, a very popular topic right now. Mm-hmm, sure is. So... As our listeners will no doubt know, there are three. Oh, this is the poker game. This is the poker game, right. There are three n- known transmission methods. There's the, you know, the direct I sneeze in your face method, which is believed to be highly efficient. Probably is. Gross, but highly efficient. Yep. There's the indirect transmission, which means I sneeze on something that you then touch and you convey that stuff to your nasal mucosa, to your respiratory mucosa somehow by presumably on your hands. And so that route's called the fomite route. And the fomite means the inanimate object that connects the two of us. You know, I pour you a glass of of juice. After sneezing on my hand, you then get the snot off of the the glass, and somehow you get it into your mouth. And the glass is the fomite. And the third one is aerosols. Okay. Now, we must admit, humbly, that we don't know much about these transmission routes for most viruses, including coronavirus uh, 19, COVID-19. There have been a lot of assumptions made, however, about how it transmits. And so you will recall that at the beginning of the episode, the dictum was, wash your hands early and often. Yep. Right? Which basically is in implying that the fomite route is very important. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, that's reasonable because at the beginning of this, we didn't know anything about COVID-19. And so it's, it's reasonable to take an abundance of caution. Okay. But there was yep. a certain amount of inconsistency in this argument because one would also argue that if you don't know that the aerosol route might be important, you should also, through an abundance of caution, recommend masks. And we did not do that. And so I think that that, that yep. to me sounds like that feels like a screw up in terms of our messaging. And it has turned sure. out to be a big screw up as we have since learned that COVID-19 seems to mainly spread by the aerosol route and only occasionally by the fomite route. And so we got that one. I'm not allowed to swear. It, no. It rhymes with bass backwards. Okay? Mm. So. Um, so you're anti-fomite is what you're telling us. Uh, anyway, I wanted to go back to the source uh, because this question of how did viruses transmit has really not been studied practically anywhere with one major exception, which is rhinovirus, which is the cause of the common cold. So back in the 1980s, there were two really cool experiments that were done looking at how rhinovirus moves from person to person. Now, I remember when I was an ID fellow, one of my attendings told me about this famous paper and said, this proved that, you know, people can get infected by playing cards, implying that the the, the cards are the fomites. And this was a very efficient way of, of getting rhinovirus. But I hadn't actually read the paper until a few months ago. And when I read the paper, I realized that my attending had got it completely wrong. <laughs> that the paper mm. basically showed that fomites did not transmit coronavirus. And so the way they did this experiment was ingenious. They got 34 male healthy volunteers, and they infected them with rhinovirus by squirting it up their noses. And then out of this pool of infected people, they found the eight who were the most infected, and they were like streaming the most rhinovirus out of their noses and then they and they had these guys then play poker with a bunch of uninfected volunteers who were in in several groups there was the true controls who just played poker like anyone would and by the way if you want to know they played stud draw poker because that's the obvious question that comes up they played stud draw and study draw so half of the of the 12 recipients just played poker. And the other half wore an ingenious contraption around their neck, which I think is analogous to a dog cone. Oh! Okay? Basically preventing them from touching their faces. Okay? It didn't actually look like a dog cone. cone. The cone of shame. The cone of shame. 
Yep. But it had the same thing. It was like this big sort of plexiglass hood that like was three foot across and allowed you to play poker and you could see through the hood, but you couldn't bring your hands up to your face because those, the, you know, bang into the plexiglass. So you couldn't actually touch your face at all. It was impossible. And the two but, groups, and these guys were infected with rhinovirus. No, no. These are the recipients, right? These are the uninfected okay. Okay. people who are playing okay. poker with the guys streaming rhinovirus out of their noses. Right? So the question is, what are the infection rates in the two groups? Because in the guys who don't have these plexiglass you know, objects on. In fact, there was two sets of apparatus, but I'll get to the second one in one moment. They couldn't get infected either through the aerosol route or through the fomite route. But the other guys could only get infected through the aerosol route because they can't touch their faces, right? right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to see, did these two rates differ? And they did not, basically. There was like 60%, approximately 60% in the guys who you know, had no contraption, and the contraption guys had a, an infection rate of around 56%. So statistically, no different. Okay, Very interesting. Then they, they repeated this experiment with a different contraption, where instead of wearing these cones of shame, essentially, they fixed orthopedic arm braces onto these guys that could only go between 140 and 180 degrees. So again, uh, preventing them from touching their faces because they, they, they're they like robots, yep. you know, they, they can't reach that far. And they did the same thing and they got the same results. But the the permutation on the, the guys with the arm contraptions is that after they had used, you know, they had been playing poker for 12 hours with a lunch break and a dinner break, during which time they were separated from the, the recipients so they couldn't infect each other in the cafeteria. The cards by this point and the poker chips had become noticeably sticky and oh. damp, okay? <laughs> Presumably with rhinovirus and snot. Okay, so now they took these <laughs> poker chips and these card deck and they and all of the furniture that these guys have been playing on, including the chairs and the table, and they moved it into a different room and had a new group of 12 guys play poker in that room with that deck of cards and with those poker chips. And meanwhile, the guys with the, the, in, the, in the donor room continued to play poker with another set of decks of cards and poker chips to continuously reinfect the deck. And every hour they brought in the new deck. So they had a constant supply of snow not covered cards and poker <laughs> chips that were freshly snotty, okay? And they played consecutively for 12 hours and not a single one of them got infected. Oh. So you're, so, so, the, so the point is, and then, the fomites. And they did, they cultured the fomites throughout this, these games and the fomites were indeed teeming with rhinovirus, okay? But no one's getting infected, no so the point infected. is. And, and they also had people, you know, volunteers wearing masks and gowns to protect themselves who watched the behavior of the guys playing poker to see did they touch their faces and their noses. And of course they did. They, they, in fact, in that final experiment where the 12 guys were playing with the fomite, the soaked cards, basically, there was an average of 186 documented face touchings that occurred during that period per person. So people were touching their faces constantly, and they did not get infected. And so what they concluded was that contrary to popular belief, rhinovirus basically transmits through aerosols, not through fomites. And this was the We, was we a can stop washing class. our hands? Well, this is a different <laughs> virus. It's not COVID-19, so we can't, we can't directly extrapolate. But the point I'm trying to make is that we made a huge assumption about this virus that led to a specific set of recommendations from our health authorities that, that actually were not based on any proof. Yeah. And they completely ignored this other one, which in hindsight was a major gaffe, shall we say. That's pretty cool, Chris. Yeah. And, and so the, the guys who did this experiment back in 1984 were really surprised by these results because it ran against the common belief. And so what they then tried to do the next experiment, I'm going to give you a teaser for part two, was to try to figure out mechanistically why did they not get infected? What was going on here? So we'll come back to that in a, two weeks tell you the rest of the story all right so you got a teaser so everyone's got to tune back in to find out part two and it's a it's a good one it's this like the godfather 2 it also gets an oscar oh yeah godfather 2 was was the best all right so mine is a shorter one comes from the journal social science quarterly it's a study by david peterson from iowa state university so guys who is we've discussed this before in this program who is the worst reviewer me. Who's the toughest reviewer when you get your reviews back? Statistician. Two. Reviewer number two. Uh oh. So you send your paper out for review. It comes back with reviewer number one, two, and three. And it's always reviewer number two, supposedly, that is the worst. 
So David Peterson wanted to find out whether or not that was in fact true. So what he did was he analyzed the reviewer database from political behavior. And then he essentially coded them and and figured out which ones were the the most negative. Won't go into details as to exactly how he did that, but essentially figured out which ones were the most negative. Now, I won't tell you the results yet. I will just tell you that the title of the study was Dear Reviewer 2, Go F Yourself. (laughs) That's fun. However, does, does, that fondle, to me is... Does it rhyme with, with, with bondle? Yes, sure. So this particular study, I would say, actually came up with a finding that is contradictory to the, the title in that what he actually found was there was no evidence that Reviewer 2 was either more negative about the manuscripts or out of line with the other reviewers. There was, however, evidence that reviewer number three is more likely to be more than one category in the way he categorized them below the other reviewers. And so the conclusion that he comes to is reviewer two is not the problem. Reviewer three, in fact, is. And in fact, he was such a bad actor that he even gets unwitting reviewer number two blamed for his bad behavior. So there you go. If you ever thought it was reviewer number two, it is, in fact, (laughs) reviewer number three. Well, well, that is the end of our program. If you got any feedback on this or any other episode, wait, wait, or you want aren't to suggest... we going to react to that? I mean, I feel like this is this is you know you have just gored a sacred cow here. Oh, so go for it. What do you want to tell I us? I mean, did they average one and three? I mean, were there any deviations in the in the in the in the, in the, the harshness of these comments? No, it's all reviewer number three, Chris. It's always, and I have to say, this has been my experience. My experience is reviewer number three is typically the worst. How so do they choose actually, reviewers? Like the order of reviewers. Do you know this? I think what they do is they send them out for review. Then they come back and they look at which one is the most negative and they assign that one to be reviewer number three. Uh, I think so that's no, what they do. How is this study? Was this study done across a whole bunch of different journals no. and a whole bunch of different domains? No. Don, how, you're, many, you're... how many studies, <laughs> uh, how, many, how many reviews were actually categorized? Not nearly enough, Don. This is, this is. <laughs> I think you, you may be surprised to learn this, but I think this was actually tongue in cheek. I know. No, you're joking. Yeah, no, this was not a <laughs> randomized controlled trial with uh, placebo. Mm, so, mm. anyway, there's no no p values. No p values. Mm, sorry. Fascinating. This is this is this is changing my world today. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm. So that is the end of our program. If you got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic. For us to take on, you can tweet us at, at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at, at ProfMatFox, or Chris at ID.Gill, or Don at, at DTheo1. And Don is actually on Twitter these days, which is quite nice I to know. see. Yeah. I know. Jeez, or you I can, have all this time to waste. Or you can find us <laughs> at the Population you, Health Exchange website <laughs> at www.pophealthyx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talali and Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound, editing, and teaching us all how to clap in sync. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will download our next episode.